Welcome to Things You Don't Know. In this episode, we're going to take a look at something so common and so ubiquitous in America and in American households, too, that we just hardly ever think about it until we need it. That's very true, Dr. Weaver. I found something very interesting. Over the course of the 74 podcasts we've worked on here at Things You Don't Know, we have continually discovered interesting facts about the most ordinary products. I have to tell you, before I began ferreting out all these stories, I would have laughed in the face of anyone who would have told me a soft drink company had a fleet of naval vessels or a German emperor gave a case of toilet paper to his chancellor as a Christmas present, no less. Please see our soft drink and toilet paper podcasts if you're interested in all the fascinating details. Now today, we have another intriguing product. I won't keep you in suspense too long. Paper towels. As with many things, Paper towels evolved from similar products used in ancient Rome. In those ancient times, people would often carry small cloth towels, which they tucked into the belts uh, that, that they wore to dry their hands and face. Apparently, these hand towels grew out of favor and were replaced by smaller handkerchiefs that could be carried in a pocket. Now, uh, particularly um, a little later on in history, handkerchiefs were started to be made of more stylish and expensive materials, like satin and da 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 da. And sometimes they were decorated with embroidered designs or monograms. Uh, handkerchiefs were often used, this sort of grosses me out, uh, to not only blow your nose, but to wipe your face. Uh, sounds a little gross to me. Anyhow, modern paper towels are a relatively recent product. In 1879, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, uh, was in the midst of of a surge of near epidemic proportions of colds, flus, uh, with, with symptoms of runny noses and coughs, you know, the normal things. A school teacher got the idea that with all the students going to the bathroom, the cloth towels therein were getting laden with various kinds of dirt and viruses and bacteria and all that stuff, helping the spread of the viruses. The teacher gave the students softer varieties and perhaps they crumpled them, sort of smushed them together and whatnot, um, sheets of notebook paper to wipe their hands on. I... I can imagine that would be a little more comfortable. Uh, just on a private note, there's actually a commemoration of this event in the hallway of the Pennsylvania Medical College where I had some surgery as a young child. I remember being quite fascinated by the display. But in 1907, after hearing about this event from the teacher, the Scott brothers, founders of the Scott Paper Company, reinvented the paper towel. This is the same company that manufactures the internationally known toilet paper. Uh, they manufacture it in several colors, which is a rare thing today. But this paper towel product would soon transform personal cleanliness throughout the country. The creation of paper towels was also thought supposedly to be the outcome of the Brown Company receiving a large amount of paper rolls that couldn't be used for the origin, their original purpose, which was as toilet paper. The head of the research 
department for the Brown Company, Dr. William Corbin, was an early conservationist, and he was determined to find a better use for the paper. His colleague, Harold Titus, happened to own the Cascade Mill in New Hampshire, which was right near the Berlin-Gotham rail line. And he persuaded the owner of that railroad to start using these paper towels in his laboratories. And these new paper towels took off and were soon very popular aboard trains in, in restaurants and hotels as they could be easily disposed of and didn't require laundering. You know, it's interesting. Some inventions are brought about after putting years and years of hard work, carrying out countless experiments, facing a score of failed turns and misses, and finally unveiling the product in all its glory, while others not so much. The history of paper towels falls in the second category, giving it a great twist of its own. The history of paper towels is closely linked with that of the toilet tissues history. Paper towels are second only to toilet paper in paper product production. Say that about five times fast, folks, uh, in the United States, anyhow. Americans use approximately 45% of the paper towels used worldwide with Western Europe following. Um, the, the South Americans are the very least likely to use paper towels. Not sure why that is, but uh, it is. Uh, what's interesting to me is where the foundational work creating the towel came from. As I said before, uh, it was undertaken by the Scott paper company, which was started in 1879, the same year as this terrible epidemic. And by 1907, it was a leading brand name in the creation of toilet paper. The company was doing very well for itself when on a particular occasion, bad news came a knocking. Arthur Scott, the president of the company, was told an entire batch of toilet tissue paper an entire railroad car full was rendered useless. It could neither be used or shipped and would have to be discarded. The reason cited was that it was rolled into extremely thick rolls, too thick rolls, and hence could not be used as intended. And that meant that the Scott Paper Company would have to incur a heavy loss Arthur Scott was left wondering what his next step should be and whether the paper should simply be discarded as was being advised. But before any step was taken, he remembered reading about an article in the 1879 tabloid, The Philadelphia World. The article was about a Philadelphia teacher who had started handing out, as we said before, soft paper to her students suffering from the flu and the common cold. She did this to act as a substitute to the cloth towels that were often in use in community abortions, which she believed correctly would only lead to the spread of disease. Instead of these, a soft paper could be used once and disposed of in the trash can and would prevent the transmission of germs from one sick kid to another, which any parent will tell you happens mm -hmm. with great frequency. Scott loved the idea so much that he was convinced he could use the discarded paper for that same purpose. And that is what he set about to do. First, he cut the paper into individual sections and designed them into towel-sized sheets. After that, he sold them as a more effective preventative measure from both the onset of diseases and still later as disposable paper towels to restaurants and hotels to be used in public washrooms. The product was named Sanitowel, highlighting its superior hygienic qualities. In 1931, Scott made history by introducing the first paper towels for kitchen cleaning. Now, 
these paper towels were like 18 inches long and 13 inches wide. Similar to what we have today. The paper towel was not an instant success. It actually took years before paper towels became a significant part of the American home. Now, how do you think paper towels soak up all that water or other liquid? Well, the paper towel is produced in several steps, which we will discuss in a moment, resulting in a loose weave and incorporating spaces that trap moisture. Now, some paper towels have designs on the paper, like diamonds or circles or whatever, which also, because of the ridges in those designs, aid in absorption. Now, a clever, clever design factor is that paper towels are typically comprised of multiple layers, usually two to four layers. Now, what this does is it adds uh, strength and enhances absorption without compromising softness. I must admit that the description of the manufacturing process of paper towels was both very revealing and very interesting, which surprised me since... I do not generally focus on manufacturing processes. You mean you're not a factory worker, Dr. Deneen? <laughs> Can't imagine. Not, not yet. But the process is quite ingenious. You put down a smear of non-toxic adhesive on a drying cylinder upon which is put a layer of the paper pulp that has been cleaned and often bleached. The dryer, known as a Yankee dryer, dries the pulp while simultaneously enhan enhancing the adhesion of the glue. The scraper is then used to scrape away the pulp until it is the desired thickness. Then, the scraped off pulp is then combined with fresh pulp and the process continues. Some brands boast of having a larger number of thinner layers. This provides for greater absorption. Yeah, one of the advantages and touted uh, about paper towels is hygiene. It has been proved that paper towels are more hygienic than cloth towels or those little hot air blowers. You know, you go into the bathroom, you punch the little thing and the hot air blows out and you wipe your hands under it, da 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 Okay. Now, cloth towels, we can easily see that they transmit, transmit bacteria unless they are washed in hot water after every use. Yeah, that would be pretty impractical, particularly in a public restroom. Uh, air dryers have been shown to blow bacteria around Paper towels can be thrown away and do not have those disadvantages. There was an interesting show on TV. I don't know. Some of you may know it, hopefully. Uh, was called the Mythbusters TV show, which aired between 2003 and 2015. And, and they did a nice little study on this, which I really found very interesting. And they actually did a very good job of doing it. I must admit I missed that show. They did some wonderful things. The last topic we want to look at is the ecologic impact of paper towels. It has sometimes been said paper towels have a deleterious impact on the environment. I would argue that is not true. I would argue that bamboo and other paper creating products can and should be renewed through future growth. In other words, Get out there, folks, plant more trees and plant more bamboo plants. The disposal of paper towels by burning can also prove very effective in creating energy for generating electricity. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I find very, very interesting 
Now, bamboo grows faster. It gets to the mature point where you can actually use it as pulp for uh, paper products. Grows faster than trees. And is in some is is less costly to harvest, and yet, when you go to purchase some uh, paper product that is uh, based on bamboo, it's more expensive. Can you say corporate greed? Mm, yes, I think so. Uh, and this the, the thing that you mentioned about using paper towels by burning them. Uh, to create or generate electricity. Uh, actually, um, as, as some of you know, I was uh, in Florida for quite a while. And they have a program there where they actually use garbage to, um, to, to run the generator plant uh, to produce electricity for a lot of central Florida. And the interesting thing is they were so efficient in doing this that they were running out of garbage. So they came up with a clever idea. They got garbage from bum, 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 New York. Good heavens, really? <laughs> yes, indeed. And in, they... They use a process of, of um, you know, like blowing like a billows that, that has, you know, in a blacksmith shop, the old time blacksmith shops, so that the, the, heat, the, the heat in the fire is very, very hot and therefore burns most of the things up. Plus, they have a really good um, exhaust system so that it doesn't pollute. Uh, it, it's a really interesting thing. More, more places ought to check into that well listen this has been kind of fun um we like to do things that are a little bit less uh serious from time to time and it's uh it's kind of a you know it, to me when when we look around and we do this uh sometimes folks we'll uh dr Deneen and i'll go Okay, so what's some ordinary uh, product that we can um, do something with and check out if there's any history to it or whatever? And we'll just sit there and we'll say, okay, I'm, I'm looking around here and I see this, I see that. And we'll just do that until, oh, hey, that would be kind of cool. I don't know anything about that. Is that not right, Dr. Dean? It certainly is. And I think some of our most interesting and even some of our best podcasts have come out of that. Going all the way back to my perennial favorite, when you asked what I like and in a moment of irritation that turned out to be revelatory, I said Lime Coke, and we got a whole wonderful thing out of that. <laughs> yeah, when you said that, I said, okay, Dr. Dean, we will do that. And you said... I don't think anybody's going to want to listen to this. I've never been happier to be proved wrong in my life. I got to own up to that, folks. I did not know what the heck I was talking about. But this great man who has demonstrated his vision time and time again, he saw something I didn't. You know what I saw? Ignorance. I didn't know. That was what I saw. And it wasn't my brilliance. It was like, oh, no, I don't know anything about that. Duh. And, <laughs> and so, you know, we did the research and wow. Uh, you, you should listen to that, uh, that uh, podcast. It was a lot of fun. It because, was. I mean, if you, if you recall, we found out that, you know, uh, the Pepsi Cola company was selling um, their soft drinks in Soviet Russia. It was Soviet Russia at that time when they were doing that. And they couldn't pay them. They couldn't pay Pepsi in dollars or money because they didn't have any. So they paid them in battleships. 
and and when <laughs> Pepsi finally um, eliminated their navy, they had I think the thirteenth largest navy in the world. They kept one of the ships as a company yacht, but other than that. But the funniest part for me was when uh, Gorgi Zukov, the great Soviet commander of World War II, liked Coca-Cola. Um, Eisenhower convinced Robert Woodruff, the head of that company, to create a version of it that took all the logos of a bourgeois product off it and put red stars and pictures of Marx and Lenin so Zukov could drink it without his party bosses being annoyed at it. Yeah. I mean, the point is here, this is, this is an absolute great example of boots on the ground history, is it not? I couldn't agree more. You take something and you look at it and say, what, what really went on here? What, where did this really come from? And when you go down that path, you do see that a lot of things that we take for granted that had super impact on history and on culture didn't come from the politicians, didn't come from people that you know about and hear about all the time, came about from somebody saying, oh, hey, I can do something with this. Anyhow, it was fun. So, Listen, I would hope that while you're thinking about it, because I'm going to have you think about it right this minute, go down there and give us a like. Click on the reminder bell so that you get posted on, on new things that we're coming up with. Um, we have some really good things uh, in the offing here. Um, and I promise we're going to get our other podcast going uh, called History Twists, which is really exciting. We have... Three of them in the works right now, even as we speak. And that's going to be fun. But yeah, give us a like. Leave us a comment too. Hey, we like to read them. And uh, it gives us other ideas. And we do appreciate it very much. You sure do, friends. Okay. So long for now. All right. Catch you later. Bye. Bye-bye.